All right, so we're going to get started um, today. I, uh, I'm going to give a, a kind of a demo. We're going to switch back from V-Ray into Rhino, and we'll spend a little bit more time kind of developing more complex details. And I think one of the, one of the things that you'll learn in Rhino is that sometimes we get the basic mass of a shape down, and then we start to fine tune the little pieces of it. And as you start modeling, you can get more and more detailed uh, going forward. And sometimes the level of detail ends up not mattering because you're, you're rendering from too far away and you won't see it. Other times you want to do a close-up rendering of a particular detail. And in that case, something, you know, fine detail starts to matter. So we're going to work today to create a little piece of a bridge. Um, and then next class, we'll work to create a little piece of a glass curtain wall. Uh, and then we'll ultimately be putting those together in a little mock-up scene. Um, but this is a good way, again, of kind of practicing getting basic skills down in Rhino uh, and, and working forward. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen here. And then you got to give me just a second to get reorganized so I can move my uh, Zoom window around. And then make sure I get my chat window up here. Perfect, just in case somebody has questions. There we go, we're all set. So I went ahead and I pulled up the Canvas page that is our exercise uh, 205 page. Uh, this is kind of the walkthrough of what we're doing today. And uh, I'm gonna do this obviously live so you can work through it, but I'll refer back to this uh, kind of step-by-step -step to help you see how all of this comes together. And you can certainly use this as a guide for you as well. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to open up Rhino. And I did go ahead and log into the remote desktop. I've already logged into my OneDrive folder, so that's ready. Um, and I did that in advance because I wanted to basically have my, my keystrokes being logged already. I'm going to choose the large object inches template which is right there. Oops, looks like I have to stay okay first. There we go, large object inches. That's gonna be my default template. And we can confirm that that was chosen correctly because my units down here are labeled as inches. So that's what I want. If you created a new file and it says millimeters there, you can always right click and go to unit settings and change the units into inches from there. I can close all of these V-Ray toolbars except for the large one though we won't actually be using any V-Ray today. I'm going to go ahead and dock this V-Ray toolbar right there at the top. And then I'll go ahead and make my window full size, kind of get things customized here. We'll turn on our layers so that I can see the layers. We'll make that just a little bit bigger. And there we go. So when we start working today, we're going to start by drawing kind of the outline of the shape that we're ultimately going to be creating. And so that shape that we'll start with is the one that I'm showing you right here in Canvas. So it has some dimensions on it. Uh, it's, the inside is 48 inches. The height here is 36 inches, though technically that's not correct. It should be 42 by code. That's a mistake on my end. Um, but we'll go ahead and start by drawing that particular shape. So I'm going to work, and I can actually start by drawing in just the top view. I could work entirely in the perspective view, but I think sometimes it's easier to continue to, to focus on using different views. So I'm going to double click on the top viewport to make that full size. And then I'll go ahead and start with my polyline tool, which is right here. So I'll click on polyline, and I'm going to start at 0, 0. So again, in order to make this accurate, I'm going to go ahead and type in the value 0, 0, and then I know I'm starting right there at that origin. The, the line that I'm going to draw, I want to be perfectly vertical. So I'll go ahead and come down here and turn on my ortho. So I'll click the button for ortho down here at the bottom of my page, and that will make sure that I'm snapping so that I'm drawing perfectly vertical. And I'm going to go up by my 36 inches. I'm going to stay consistent to um, the drawing that I have on the page, even though it's technically not correct by code, uh, because that's what you guys will be referencing from. So I've drawn a line that is 36 inches up, and then I need to draw a line that comes over here by four inches. So there it is at four inches. I've typed four quotation mark to get the four inches, and then I click in that direction. 
Now this next line comes down to right here, but it also goes over by two inches. So this is a perfect opportunity to actually use your relative coordinates. So I will actually say at x distance first, which would be negative two inches. So I want to go to the left by two inches. And then I want to go down, so comma, negative, because I'm going down in the y direction, 36 inches. So it would be at negative 2, comma, negative 36. And when I do that, you can see that the preview there is showing me that slope. I'll hit Enter to finish the line. And there it is. I could create this another way. I could draw a little sample, um, you know, a little L and then draw the line afterward, that would, that would certainly work, but it's a little bit less efficient than using the, those coordinates. So that's where using those coordinates has a lot of power and learning how the coordinates work back in 202 has reference right here today. So let's continue. I'm gonna draw a line that's down six inches. It's gonna go in there. Now the next one, I need to go over by 30 inches and down by six inches. So this is again an opportunity for those relative coordinates. I could say at, this time it's gonna be 30 in the X direction, comma, negative six inches. And I'll hit enter and that creates the bottom. Now I can continue drawing up the other, other side. So this time it would be at 30 inches, comma, six inches, cause it's positive six inches. This would be six inches. And then this would be, again, at, we're going to go negative 2 in the x, followed by 36 in the y, positive 36. We'll go over 4 inches here. We'll come down 36 inches there. And then we'll come all the way across to finish. And that creates my overall shape. Now, there are certainly other methods for doing this, and I'm going to show you these other methods as we go forward. But in terms of efficiency, let's say that I started here. Uh, let me go up my 36. There it is. There's my 4. And this was at uh, negative 2, comma, negative 36. This was down 6. This is at uh, 30, comma, negative 6. I could come up in this scenario, I drew just half of it. And then I took my half and I go up to transform and then mirror. Oh, let me turn on my end snap here. And I can mirror that half, which saves me from drawing the second half. So that's certainly always a strategy. You can use that for efficiency purposes. And actually I'll extend this a little bit later to show you once we're in 3D, how you can use that to your advantage. So let me go ahead and get rid of that. And we'll work back with our original shape there. So that original shape should match up nicely to what we're seeing here. There's a few extra lines that I've drawn that'll just help us when we create our surfaces. I can go ahead and, and add those extra little lines in. We'll use my polyline tool. We're just gonna draw straight across there. I'm gonna right click to repeat and draw a little diagonal there. Right click to repeat, little diagonal, right click to repeat, and I'll go straight across there. Okay, so now that we're seeing all of those, I'm gonna switch out of the top view. So I'll double click on top, and I will double click on perspective. So I'll activate that perspective viewport. And there it is. So my shape here exists. If I orbit a little bit, we can see it's laying flat. So the first thing that I want to do is I want to pull this so that it's up in three dimensions. So let me select all of it. I'm doing a selection from left to right that contains the whole object. And then I'll use the rotate 3D command. We used that before in class. It's under transform and then rotate 3D. Alternatively, I could type in the command line here, rotate 3D, and then hit enter. And it's going to ask for the start of my rotation axis. My rotation axis is going to be that line right there. So I'll click on this point. Then I'll click on that point. So my axis is there. My reference would be up one side. So we'll go up one side. And then I basically want to pull this up until it's standing vertical. So one more time, let me undo that. 
and we'll do it again. It's under transform, rotate 3D. My axis of rotation is right there. I'm gonna snap here as my reference and I'll pull this up till it's standing straight up. Now it's important that I had ortho on because that's gonna jump straight to vertical. If I didn't have ortho on, I can also hold down the shift key and that'll cause me to jump to 90 degrees. So now that I have this shape, I'm gonna go ahead and choose to offset this shape. Now I have two options here. I could offset it or I could copy it. If I choose offset, I would go up to transform and then, oh, maybe it's curve offset. Yeah, sorry, it's curve offset, offset curve. Alternatively, I could just type in offset into the command line. And so we see right now that it's actually creating an offset that's right in line with my shape. That's not what I want. I wanna be able to offset it going back. So if we look up here, when it says side to offset, we'll come over here to where it says in C plane. Currently that's set to no. If I click on that, it's now gonna let me offset it to the front or the back of my object. So we need to set a distance of four feet, which would be 48 inches. Alternatively, I could type in four and then apostrophe, that would be four feet. I'll hit enter. And that's going to let me either create an offset back or create an offset to the front. I want it to be the back. So I'm gonna pick that side and that then creates my offset. So once again, the key there was when I went into the offset command, I changed this in C plane from being no, which is there, to being yes. And that lets me go forward or backward with it. The alternative would be to take my object and to use the copy command. So I type copy and then type the distance four feet and that would create a copy at four feet. Either method is perfectly acceptable for what we're trying to do. So I have these two pieces and what I want to do is I want to create surfaces between them. So let's go ahead and create, let's use layer five down here. I'm gonna rename this to be bridge. And I'm gonna change the color of this object to be black. And then I'll say, okay. And I'll make that the active layer by clicking and moving that check mark from default to bridge. And this matters once I start creating the three-dimensional uh, or the solid surfaces. So at this point, I wanna select opposing sides of my two pieces. So I'll take this piece and I'll take this piece. I'll hold down shift to select them both. And then I'll go up to my surface tool and I'll choose loft. Now, when I create this loft, it's going to ask me first, where do I want my seam to be? And as long as they're at the same point on either side, I'll get good results and I can go ahead and press enter. I'll show you what happens when I do it the other way in just a second. So these options are all fine. I'll say, okay. And I now have a series of surfaces. Now, since I'm seeing them in wireframe mode, it's much easier to see them in shaded mode. So we'll switch over to shaded and there you go, you could see those surfaces. So I could also, I could explode these two. So if I went up to edit and then explode, I could then select just single pieces and I can loft those together. So I could say loft and that would make those two go together. Likewise, I could say loft and that would make those two go together. So sometimes having that uh, control can be helpful. I told you I'd talk to you about the seam problem. So let's select both of these again. And let me choose loft. Now, this was that seam. If these seams are not in the same place, so let's say I moved this seam over there. When it goes to create the loft, it's going to connect this point to that point. So let me show you. I'll go ahead and press enter and we'll see a preview instead of looking like a nice, neat surface, this surface is connecting to that edge. This surface is connecting to that edge. And you can see that we're kind of twisting the surface all the way around. So obviously that wasn't my intent. 
So let me cancel it. And we'll go back one more time to surface and then loft, making sure that those are on opposing pieces. Yep, that's good. They're pointing in the same direction. Good. We'll go ahead and hit enter. And that then builds out the sides of this bridge. So the next part is I need to fill in these side pieces. So I have a couple different ways. In my little handout, I talk about using the patch tool. If I'm using the patch tool, I need a border curve that goes all the way around this object. And I could certainly take this curve that I've already created and go up to surface and then patch. Uh, I'm going to change my U and V spans to two. And I'll say, OK. And that would create a surface that's on the end. There's nothing wrong with creating the surface this way. Unfortunately, when I go to make some modifications later, when I go to, to clip the corners a little bit, this is going to present some problems. So instead, I'm going to delete that. I'm going to create several separate surfaces. So I'll start with my surface from three or four corner points. I think this is actually a little bit easier than using the patch command. So even though the directions say patch, I'm going to use the three or four point corner points. And I'm actually going to create a surface that's just right there. I'll also create this little triangle right here. And I'll hit Enter. Same thing here. We'll go one, two, three, four, and then Enter. And one more right here. One, two, three, and then Enter. Now I still have this piece down at the bottom. So it's a little bit harder. Let's go across. Let's go one, two, three, and four. And then we'll fill in the very bottom. One, two, and three. And that fills it all in. Now that I've created those pieces, I could select them all. And I can copy them from the front to the back, like that. Now, in the interest of explaining things and why I did this, I'm actually not going to do that, though I want you to. I'm going to instead do a patch on this backside so you can see the difference. So I'll take the curve that I created. I'll patch it. And I'll say OK. And then when we start to work with it, you'll start to see why it causes problems. So this is the fundamental shape that we're trying to create. And as I said in the beginning today, that we're going to keep adding progressive levels of detail to this shape. So this is the primary shape, and it's going to take you a while to get to the primary shape. But then we're going to try to enhance the primary shape. And the way that we're going to do that is we're going to create basically bevels around the end. So we'll use the chamfer surface tool. So I can type it in. It's chamfer SRF for chamfer surface. Or I could go up to, I believe it's surface, and then chamfer surfaces. And it's going to ask to select the first surface to chamfer, but it also wants to know distances. So on my distances here, they're currently set at one inch by one inch. Let's go ahead and change those to be a half inch by a half inch. So I'll type 0 0.5 and 0 0.5. Uh, oops, 0.5. There we go. Chamfer distance on the second one is 0.5. Somehow it didn't change. Then it's going to say select first surface to chamfer. If I pick this surface here, and then I select the second surface right there, it's going to essentially bevel the edge. Now notice once I've done that, when I go to try to move this, see how the, the object kind of goes off the screen as I orbit? Because the center of my rotation isn't this object. The center of my rotation is somewhere over here. So I can reset my view. And this is something that's really important in Rhino is to get used to resetting your view. I can reset my view around this object by typing Z for zoom. And then one of my options here is selected. So I'll type S for selected, or I'll type selected. And what that does is it recenters my, my orbit or my view around that one object, which makes it much, much easier to work with. So I'll zoom out a little bit, but you can see that it's orbiting around that object. So let's continue with this. Let's do another chamfer surface. So I'll go to surface, 
and then chamfer surfaces. And I'm going to chamfer this surface to this surface. All right, that turned out pretty well. Let's chamfer, same thing. I'll right click to repeat the command. I'll chamfer this surface to that surface. Okay. Now, what about if I want to chamfer this surface to that surface? Well, that would be good. So I'll right click and say, let's do this surface and that surface. And let's chamfer this surface to that surface. Now, when I do that, you'll see that I end up with some problems. So I have some surfaces that don't really meet at that corner. So I need to clean this up. So I've done the chamfers, but now I need to clean it. So I'm going to use my polyline tool right here. And I'm going to draw a triangle that goes from this endpoint to that endpoint, down to this endpoint, and back on itself. That triangle is kind of like a little magic triangle because it's going to allow me to trim off the extra pieces of the surface. So I'll select it, and then I'll go up to Edit and then Trim. And I can actually select these surfaces that extend past my triangle like that. So now that's nice and clean. I'll hit Enter to finish. And then I need to fill this in. I could use my surface from three or four corner points, or I could use the patch command, either one. And I would fill that little triangle in. And I'll hit Enter. And there it is, nicely filled in. So let's do the same thing right here. So I'll use my uh, polyline tool. I'll draw my triangle. Right there. Once I've done that, I'll select that triangle. I'll go up to edit and trim, or I'll type trim into the command line. And I'll trim off these extra pieces like that. When I'm done, I'll hit enter. And then this is where you can use that surface from three or four corner points, or I could simply just do a patch. You type in patch. I'll say OK. And that would then fill in that little piece of surface as well. So that turned out pretty well. Now on the back side here, we can try to do it as well. So let me go back into my chamfer surface. So I'll go to surface, uh, chamfer surface. And we can do those two. We can do those two. And we can do these two. Now I told you that back here, because I did this as a patch, we'd run into some problems. Let me point out the problem. So the problem occurs down here. So this surface, the edge of this surface is continuous all the way to the bottom. So when I try to do the chamfer, it ends up continuing the chamfer all the way down to this corner rather than ending here like it did there. So by breaking this surface into separate pieces, when I control, I'll have an easier way of controlling the chamfer. So right here, I could chamfer these surfaces. We'll go to uh, surface. Chamfer surface there and there. And I make a nice clean connection right there. Versus over here, where I really don't have a clean connection. That's still kind of out. That's there. So I encourage you to break those apart and draw the surfaces separately. That's why I'm doing it this way instead of this way. So let's focus back on the front side here. We have a good chamfer happening there. Let's chamfer this surface to that underside. Chamfer F SRF there and there. Let's chamfer this one there, there, and there. We're going to have a few issues as these come together, but I'll show you how we'll fix those. Keep working my way up around those two. Again, I'm just right clicking to repeat the last command. And we'll do this surface here to that there. OK, so now I'm at a place where I've gotten most of the chamfers out of the way, but I have some issues that I still need to resolve. So one issue would be that this surface is extending way out here as part of, it's not chamfering anymore. So I can draw a line from right there, just like we did with the triangles. 
and I can use that line as a trim. So I'll type trim. And let me get rid of that surface. I hope. And there it is, it's gone. I'll hit enter. And so I still have kind of a hole that's in here. So I can fill that in using my surface from three or four pointer, corner points like that. And that would fill that piece in as well. Now, you see that my lines were originally on the default layer. If they start to get confusing, you can turn off the lines so you're only seeing the surface. So now I'm only seeing the surface. Sometimes that's a little bit easier. Okay, this one down here, the line actually kind of already exists. I can use this object as a trim. And I can trim that little extra piece. I'm not asking you to chamfer the very bottom. That can stay at a point, nor am I asking you to chamfer that point there or this line there. So let's come back over to this side. And really this exercise is designed for you to spend a lot of time zooming around and adjusting details. So it should take a while to work your way through this whole object. I'm actually not gonna work my way through the whole object because uh, it would take me too long in the demo and you wouldn't have enough time to do your practice. So let me go back to trim, I've typed in trim and I can trim off that little piece again. And I'll hit enter to finish. Now I can, just like I did before, I can patch that little piece in, but I also have the ability to turn on control points. So I can come over here and I can show object control points. And it's showing me where the original object is that has been trimmed. So it's currently trimmed to right there, but I can get this whole object. And I could do that by typing in the untrim command. It's the opposite of trim and clicking on that edge. That gives me the whole object back. And then I could manipulate this corner point. So let me select that corner point. Oh, come on. Oh, I'm still in the untrim. There we go. Select this. I can turn my points on and I could then edit with this point. I can move it from there to there. Now that twists this surface ever so slightly. So I would actually have to take the surface and then trim it. Trim that surface there and this surface there to get an accurate result. That's kind of a more advanced way of fixing it. And technically, this surface twists just a little bit. Um, but you could do it that way as opposed to patching it in. I'm OK if you just patch it in or surface from three or four corner points to kind of fill that little triangle in. All right, let's look at this inner corner. So we need to, once again, draw a line from here to there. I'll use that line as a trim to get rid of that piece. And then we can surface from three or four corner points to fill that little triangle piece in there. So we're down to one last piece right here, there and there. We'll select it, trim. There we go. Surface from three or four corner points, one, two, three, enter, and that fills that in. So I've managed to work my way all the way around. The only piece that's left is up here. So this is good review. Now, once again, I'm over here looking on this side. And when I go to orbit, it's kind of moving my object outside of my field of view. So I can select that single object, type Z for zoom, S, enter for selected. And my view is now centered on that object instead. So a large part of what we're trying to do today in this exercise is to learn the manipulation of move, recenter your view, do your orbit around this, and start to address these finer levels of detail. So I'll draw the triangle just like I did initially. And I'm going to hit Enter. There we go. I'm going to select that triangle and then type Trim. And we'll get rid of these extra pieces there and there. I'll hit Enter. And I can use Patch. Notice that Rhino keeps my triangle selected after my commands. That makes life a little bit faster when you're inter interacting with the command line. So one more triangle. One. Oops, that was not right. Control-Z to undo that. Two, three back together. 
select it, trim, and there it is. I'll hit enter to finish the trim, and then I can use the patch. So surface and then patch. And we'll say OK. And that fills that in as well. So I want you to work your way around the object. Ultimately, you'll be doing this side of the object as well. But in the interest of kind of explaining how you can move quicker in Rhino, I want you to do all four sides. But I want to show you a strategy. And that is that if you, if you manage to model just a quarter of it, so let me copy this over like that. And let's say that I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to perform a little cut here. So I'm going to go to trim. And we're going to trim off all of this stuff. There we go. Some of it just needs to be deleted. So let me hit enter to finish the trim, and then we can take the rest of this and just delete it. There we go. Let me create one more. Oops. It didn't trim all the way because my. Let me move it vertically here. It didn't fully intersect my object. There we go. Let's try it one more time. Trim. All right, now we can delete that part. Bear with me for just a second. The, the point is that I wouldn't have actually modeled everything. I would have started with just a smaller piece of this, but in order to mimic what's happening, I'm doing it, let's go to midpoint snap here. There we go. Now I can go ahead and trim that again. So I'll type trim. And we'll get rid of the back half there. And then I can get rid of this. And I tend to delete by typing DEL for delete, but you could just hit the delete key on your keyboard. The point is that if I have this piece, which is just a quarter of this overall piece, I can use symmetry to help myself out. So once I've modeled that, I can go up to transform and then I can go to mirror. And then I can go ahead and snap there and there. And that creates one half. Then I could select both of these again and I could go to mirror again. So let's go to transform and then mirror. And I can mirror those. And so that's a far more efficient from a modeling standpoint way to create this shape than to build it all from scratch. So it's something to be aware of uh, that you can use to your advantage long term. For our purposes today, I want you to actually build it as a whole object because it's going to give you practice on every one of these corners that you kind of need to work through. And I know that it's tedious and I know that I'm able to go through it much quicker than you will be able to. And that's because I've had so much practice. I've worked in Rhino for so long. So I want you to take your time and create this. When you're done, go ahead and make sure you save the 3D object. So I'll go to File and then Save. And I want to save it into my OneDrive folder. Let me go into my live demonstrations here. And this is 205. Let's get a new folder here, spring of 2022. Oops. And let's call this bridge. And there we are. So minimum. I want this, and you can do a screen capture. So I'd go to capture to file and save it. But since you've been working in Rhino, it wouldn't hurt to, to actually apply, or excuse me, since you've been working in V-Ray, it wouldn't hurt to actually do a little bit of V-Ray work right now just to reinforce those concepts. So let's go ahead and let's create, I'll use layer four here. Let's make that active. I'm going to change the color to black. And I'm going to rename that to be IP for infinite plane. That's now active. Let's go ahead and change V-Ray to be the default renderer. I'll come up to render. I'll go to current render, and I'll say V-Ray for Rhino. Now that's current. Then I can click on that V-Ray infinite plane tool. 
which gives me my infinite plane. Now, my object is actually below where my infinite plane is. So I either need to move my infinite plane down or my object up. So if I want to move my object up, I want to make my selection from up here where I'm in the sky. Because if I try to make my selection where the infinite plane is, I'm just going to move the infinite plane. So we don't want that. So I'm going to select from up here so that I can select my whole object. There it is. I can go up to transform and then move. And this is going to be a vertical move. So I'll make sure I click on vertical. And we'll bring that up so it's above my plane. Nice. So I've got that. I need to install my basic directional light. So let's use a box. So we use that box method again. So there's a little box. Let's use the basic directional light right there. We'll snap the end of the light direction vector to that corner. The start will snap to that corner. And there's my light. We can delete the box. We don't need that anymore. And we can look kind of at my object, say right about like that. The last piece would be to apply a material to this object. So let's open the V-Ray Asset Editor. There it is. Let's look at our materials. So we'll open the drawer out to the left. And of course, the library hasn't been downloaded. So we'll go ahead and click on Download. While that's downloading, we'll check on the rest of the settings. If I go to settings, um, let's look first at the camera here. The exposure value by default is at 10. It's probably going to need to be up in the neighborhood of 14. So we'll go ahead and change that. The rest of the results are probably OK. Render output, we could have it match the viewport. There we go. And the rest of these all look OK. So we'll wait for our materials to download. It's the one thing I didn't do ahead of time. I try to remember to do these things ahead of time, but I forgot. Now we're almost there. All right, perfect. So we've got those. Uh, let's make this bridge concrete. So I'll use concrete. Now there's a bunch of different concretes that I could pick from. Uh, any one of them would, would be fine for right now. Let's, uh, let's use one of the concrete floorings. I'll use this one here. And because it's all on the bridge layer, instead of applying to the object, I can actually right click and say apply. Oh, it's not going to let me yet. Uh, let's add to the scene. Now it's listed in my scene. Now I should right be, be able to right click and say apply to layer and choose the bridge. And that's going to apply the material to everything on the bridge layer, which is right here. So we'll deal with the, the texture and what it looks like. But let's go ahead and do a render. I'll click on the little teapot icon to perform a render. And we can tell that I was able to create a shadow. That's good. I've got a texture on my object here. That's also good. Uh, and it's gone ahead and finished the rendering. And so I can go ahead and save my file. So minimum, I want a screen capture. Uh, ideally, I want a full render like I just did. So let's put it in today's folder. And let's see here. It's 205. And I'm going to save it not as a PNG, but as a JPEG. And we'll say this is bridge. Oops. And we'll go ahead and click Save. 
and that will be the image that I post to Canvas for today. Do make sure that you save the 3D file. We'll come back and use that in exercise 207. So we'll go uh, file, save, make sure that 3DM is saved. That's good, it's successfully saved. We have a rendering and that's what we're going to post for today, okay? So I know that it's gonna take you guys a while to get through it. So you have a little bit of extra time. I finished lecture a few minutes early. So you guys can um, go and start working on it now or you can put in the time later, but I've given you a little bit of extra time to kind of work your way through it. Before I let you all go though, are there any questions 